So much good conversation. Wasn't that a great start to the program? Yes. I'm always so proud of our students and faculty. They do great work. And you're about to meet another great faculty member, Dr. Jamal Watson, is our Associate Dean in our School of Business and Graduate Studies. He also is the chair of our program for um, the uh, Strategic Communications and Public Relations. He's also executive editor of Diverse Issues Magazine. He's currently writing a book about the Reverend Al Sharpton and also writing a book on student loan debt burdens, right, Dr. Watson? Am I? Yeah, you're writing two books right now as we speak. And he's going to introduce the star of this segment, a woman whose writing we all enjoy all the time, Washington Post columnist Jennifer Rubin. Jennifer, thank you for being with us today. I'll turn it over to Dr. Watson. Thank you so much, Madam President. Let's, let's give President McGuire a round of applause for her vision and her leadership and for convening this symposium. This is not an easy thing to do. And so we thank you, Madam President, for your hard work and for bringing us all together. I'm really excited because uh, we get a chance today to engage with uh, my new friend here, uh, Jennifer Rubin, who I've had a chance to, to engage with earlier in the week and we just had a lovely conversation. Uh, her bio is here, so I'm not gonna read it, but let me just tell you, for those of you who do not read her columns, you should. <laughs> and so I would commend them to you all uh, because her insight and analysis is so important. But beyond her columns, she's been a, a labor lawyer for more than two decades. And, and we see her sometimes on MSNBC uh, analyzing the issues of the day. So with that, let's turn it over to Jennifer Rubin. She's going to talk and then we're going to engage in the conversation. And I want this to be as interactive as possible. So uh, think about questions that you might want to ask that we can uh, engage in the dialogue. So with that, let's give a Trinity welcome to Jennifer Rubin. Thank you so much and thank you for having me. I will tell you, uh, I was getting a little nervous following that uh, first panel. They were quite articulate and uh, as I was saying to your president, if the entire electorate was that informed and uh, had that level of social conscience, this country would be in good hands. Um, unfortunately, we have a country that uh, is right now uh, in the depths, I think, of a great, great challenge. The book that I wrote, which uh, I see that some of you uh, have, looked at the country from the perspective of 2018 to 2020. What happened in the country and what happened to women after Donald Trump was elected? And I talked to women all over the country I talked to some women who decided to run for office for the first time. I talked to women who ran large organizations like Emily's List, uh, like Planned Parenthood. And I began to see a pattern. They began with shock and incredulity. How could this country elect such a person? And in particular over arguably at that point, the most qualified person ever to run for president, Hillary Clinton. How could it be? How had they misread their fellow Americans? And frankly, there was a great deal of commiseration and shock, but then something happened. And it was epitomized by, I think, a woman from Midland, Michigan, who met with a few friends because they had to talk this out because women connect, they resolve issues by talking, by community, by connecting. And they started meeting every week in this church just to talk about things. And then they realized, gosh, we're in this rather conservative city, and yet look how many of us. Well, by the time the 2018 election rolled around, they had 2,000 people in their network and they were running for office. The same thing happened in Chesterfield County, Virginia, where a few women who were commiserating in the, week, in the wake of the election got together and they formed liberal women for Chesterfield County. Before they came along, there were not 
Democrats running for all the races. After them, Democrats ran for all races. They have made themselves such a powerhouse that they are now sought after as an endorsement for candidates running for office. Out of three, two to 3,000. And in that same area came Abigail Spanberger, who had been a CIA agent, who had never run for office, who went to see her then congressman speak and said to herself, oh my God, I know more than this guy, and decided to run for office. She'd never run for anything, was elected to Congress, was empowered on a subcommittee by your alum, then Speaker Nancy Pelosi, served multiple terms, and is now running for governor of the state of Virginia. That's the power of women's organization. And in the depth of the first and the only, I certainly hope, Donald Trump term, I realized that the power of community, and particularly women in community, cannot be matched. There is something about women's constitution, about their natural ability to plan, to network, to handle logistics that make them incredibly powerful in the political realm. And by multiplying their force, they are able to change cities, change states, change the country. And by 2020, they were such a force and they had spread all over the country with similar networks like this that they were able to win the election in 2020. So what does that say now? What does that say about us now? Well, the good news is these organizations held together through the last four years. I was concerned that many of them would kind of fall away. Well, we've done with Donald Trump, now we're fine and let's go back to business. They didn't. Um, fortunately, they stayed in the game. In 2022, it was a much better year for Democrats than is traditionally the case in the first midterm election of a presidential term. And they're back at it again now. And this is a movement of young women, old women, women who thought they were isolated. I spoke to a woman in Alabama. I could just, in my mind's eye, see her. Maybe her hair was you know, nicely coiffed. Um, she was a social uh, butterfly. She had never done anything like this. She said, oh my gosh, I'm not gonna put up with this. She and her friends got together and they organized the HBCU in their city and they turned out to vote and they went down to the border and they protested where they were separating children from their parents. That's the power that one person has to come out of their comfort zone to make a difference. And that's what's going on now. Democracy is a participatory sport. It is not something you do from the sidelines and it is not something you do once every four years. Democracy is never safe. People are exhausted and they say, I thought we dealt with this. Why are we back? Why do we still have Donald Trump? Because every election, democracy is up for grabs. Every election, we have a choice. It may be more stark this time, but we always have a choice. And we will talk about it, I hope, more. But because the United States has never fully addressed the original sin of discrimination, of slavery, it remains a fault line in America. And it only takes one demagogue to push the buttons and in the 1930s in Germany, it was Jews. In the United States, in 2024, it is immigrants. But the language is the same. Listen to the language. It comes straight from Hitler. It, this is not an exaggeration. Vermin poisoning the blood. We have heard these before. And this Sunday, Donald Trump is going to be having a massive rally at Madison Square Gardens. I want to tell you, 
1939, there was a massive rally in Madison Square Gardens. And I urge you all, it's online, you can see it. It's a little film called Night at the Garden. Who was holding this rally? The American Bund, which was a American affiliate of the Nazi party. And they all gathered at Madison Square Gardens. And they had a giant portrait of George Washington. And they had swastikas all over the place. And they had one speaker after another talking about the white race, talking about racial superiority. A Jewish man came on the stage to protest. They ripped his pants off, nearly killed the guy. There was massive protests outside. What has changed? We still face the same problems. We still face the same evil, the same inclination to make some group an other so that others can feel empowered and can feel superior. And that someone like Donald Trump would imitate that by going back to Madison Square Gardens. That's not a dog whistle, that's a bullhorn. That's an announcement of who he is. So, because I'm part of the medium, um, does not mean I don't criticize the media. And we'll talk about that more. But I do not think the media has done a great job. And I'm not talking about small little blogs. I'm talking about my own paper. I'm talking about the New York Times. I'm talking about the broadcast networks. They are obsessed with polls, with insiderism, with these kind of niche stories. Every time you see a story that says, Democrats are worried that, that's not news. Democrats are always worried about something. <laughs> when you see a story that says, some black men will not vote for Kamala Harris, I have news, there are always some black men who do not vote for the Democrat. But this effort to turn controversy, to create insiderism, to create tension for the clicks, for the eyeballs, it is no different than what Elon Musk does on X. It's about engagement, it's about emotion, it's about keeping your eyeballs on there so they can sell ad dollars. And it has diminished our political co coverage, it has cheapened our politics, and it has distracted the American people. The New York Times constantly has polls, and they are utterly meaningless. Everything is within the margin of error. And for anyone who has a rudimentary understanding of statistics, you know that a tie poll with a plus or minus three point margin of error means Kamala Harris could be ahead by six points or behind by six points. So what purpose does this serve? It's cheap, it's attractive, it makes the reporters feel like they've got the inside scoop. What if instead of every single poll they ran a in-depth story on each aspect of the Trump agenda. What does rounding up 11 million people look like? What's the size of the police force? What does that mean for the businesses that employ them? How would this pan out? Where are these camps that he's going to be building? Have you seen a single story like that? No. That's hard, it's hard work. You have to go talk to experts, you have to go talk to individuals, you need statistics, oh, we'll just do a poll. But because we have not had that coverage, it is very easy to treat this like just any election. And it is not just any election. So I certainly hope to elevate what I think are the stakes which are, is nothing less than the survival of democracy, is nothing less than the notion that there is a thing called objective reality, that we have an obligation to one another to preserve a pluralistic democracy. We are not defined, as Donald Trump says, by race and by religion. His followers may think this is a white Christian country. I've got news for them. Look at the Declaration of Independence. All men, and by extent, and women, were created equal. The fundamental precept of this country 
is that we are not defined by race, by religion, by background, but by a common aspiration and common values. And try as he might to destroy those and replace them with white Christian nationalism, that's what is at stake, whether we want that to happen. Do we want the declaration or do we want Trump's declaration of war on democracy? So let's have a conversation and I look forward to taking this on. Thank you so much for those comments. I think you set the stage for us to have that conversation. And I want to start off, if I can, with the critique of the media. And, and, and by the way, I want you all to think of questions that you all want to ask, because we'll try to get to as many of those as possible. So you know, one of the things I think about is often that the reporting sometimes is what I call drive-by reporting, right? It's quick, it's fast, to your point, but there's no embeddedness of reporters within communities to say nothing about the ways in which we do local reporting, right? That's basically gone uh, altogether. And we love media, but, but, but I think it's a problem. H how do we, you outlined the problem there, H how do we change course and think about giving people more nuanced stories that go beyond the polls, that really dig deeply so that people can really leave informed about what is happening? It's a great question. I think that's the question that the media has to begin to ask themselves. Um, mainstream media is losing audience share, and there's a reason for it, that there's less there, that there is junk food. If you eat cotton candy all day long, you're still hungry at the end of the day. Now, you are right in that the problem begins in local media. There are many state capitals that don't have a local paper. Think about that. There is no one covering the governor, the legislature on a day-to-day -day basis. So maybe a large paper in that state will occasionally have a story. But do you think they're going to be there enough to discover corruption, to discover misuse, to discover any kind of scandal? let alone explain to people how their own government operates, even if there's no scandal. That's a story too. How does government operate? How do they put the budget together? What groups have influence? And if you don't get that, you are not covering what matters most to people. There we go. And when you think about it, state government touches people's lives many more points than does the federal government. So what do you do? The first problem they have to address is a lack of diversity in the media. When I see four white guys talking about how black women are going to vote in this election, I want to throw something at my television. And watch. Front page of the New York Times, they've been having these videos of these reporters talking to themselves day after day for white people. How in the 21st century can a major paper be so blind as to think that they understand a pluralistic society if they have cookie cutter people that all went to the same colleges, that had the same experience, that live in the same neighborhood, that think the same way. Come on, come on. When you do not have the firsthand experience, the lived experience of different communities, you will paint them with a broad brush, you will make assumptions, you will make stereotypes, and you will not do the nuanced kind of reporting that is essential because you think you know it all. You look at a few polls, you look back at some exits from a past election, oh, I know, this is what's going on. You don't know what's going on because you haven't been there, you haven't spent the time, you haven't dug in. Well, there is another way of covering the news and I would commend an institution that many of you are familiar with, which is Howard University. 
they are, and they have begun, um, the Democracy Journalism Project, which goes back to the roots of African American journalism. And if you're not familiar with it, you really should. Uh, there are great books on it, including The Defender, which is about the Chicago paper that was monumentally important um, for decades. The tradition of the black media, for those of you who are not familiar, was first of all, local focused detailed coverage. Secondly, dispensing with the notion that there is objectivity that rises above it all and that certain subjects should be covered neutrally. Well, let's hear the, just the argument for segregation and the argument against segregation. That's not what they did. They did in-depth reporting, they did analysis, and they did advocacy on the black experience. And we would not have had the civil rights movement without these institutions. White America would not have been forced to cover it had black America done so. There's a great book by David Halperstein, The Race Beat, which talks about how the media discovered the civil rights movement. I got news for him. It was being covered for a hundred years by the black press. But it's that kind of mentality. So I think we have to redefine what the mission of journalism is. I pray that Howard turns out class after class of journalists who are imbued with a understanding that there's no prize for neutrality, even if you think that's possible. What there is is a prize for truth. And truth means hard work. Truth means details. Truth means doing your homework. Truth means spending time with people so that you understand them. Not writing about people, but writing from inside. So I think it is possible, but it is a very long haul. Unfortunately, journalism is a money-making business. By the way, I don't think it should be. I think we should convert newspapers into charitable institutions that are not driven by profit. It is a public good, it is a public necessity, and why we think it's right or appropriate to have the foundation of democracy, which is a free pass, be subject to the whims of a profit motive, seems to me mind-blowing. But right now, that's what we have. And so what do they do? They have to maximize their audience. And the media has fractured, so when we talk about media, we have to talk about which media are we talking about. Are we talking about CBS, NBC, CNN? Are we talking about blogs? Are we talking about um, some you know, fly-by-night um, sort of uh, website? Uh, are we talking about a highly politicized think tank that, by the way, accepts foreign money that then writes about various subjects? What are we talking about? So. Because it is so fractured, the big media institutions are getting less and less audience. And they think the way to fix that is to make news dumber, more generalized, more like entertainment, and more poll focused. And guess what? It doesn't work. They get less and less and less because the people who are still there were the people who actually wanted real news. Those are not the people who fled onto social media. And when they see that their paper is literally so thin that there's nothing worthwhile, they're going to flee too. And you look at what has happened. I lived in Los Angeles for many, many years. The LA Times was a great paper. 
It was an institution. It covered local news. It covered the Vietnam War. It had the best sports writers. It had the best entertainment writers. The paper now is about that thick. And the owner just decreed that it would not endorse anyone for president. Thank goodness. And the editor quit. Yes. Editor that, quit. Who happens to be a Hispanic woman. She quit. And now several others have quit. You have to reclaim these institutions as principled parts of our democracy. It's the only industry that's mentioned in the Constitution, the press. It doesn't talk about manufacturing, doesn't talk about a whole bunch of other things, doesn't talk about agriculture. It talks about the free press. So if we're not willing to restore and protect the free press, it's going to get worse, and our democracy is going to get worse. And if you think the level of discussion has gotten worse in the last five years, 10 years, oh my gosh, the last 30 years, imagine when more and more of these papers fold, or the little tiny bit of news that you see on cable news gets drained away, and it's infotainment nonstop. Well, well I'm glad you, you raised that, and I, I think part of what we, the challenge we have as an institution is to think about how we train the next generation of journalists. And I, I want to give a shout out to my colleague in the back who leads, Chaz, who leads our Trinity Times here, because that's what we're doing. You, you mentioned, you mentioned Howard University, but we're also producing some really quality journalists here at Trinity who's going to go into those newsrooms and hopefully have a focus on these equity issues that we think are so important. Uh, before I open it up, let me ask you about women, and particularly women of color, because I remember in the election a couple of years ago, black women in particular were credited with helping to get elected uh, a whole number of people elected. Doug Jones, I believe you mentioned in Alabama, there were lots of people who said black women should be credited for saving uh, the, the party. H how do you assess sort of how we are thinking about black women, women of color in general, both within the Democratic Party and even outside in terms of their, um, their involvement in this election? Black women have the highest rate of voting of any demographic group. And arguably, that's because they have the most at stake. Those are the people who are raising the kids. Those are the people who are trying to make the family budget fit. Those are the people who are, by and large, responsible for health care. So it matters. It is not theoretical. It is not a luxury for them whether to vote. They vote because their lives depend upon it. And as a result, they are a highly praised demographic group. And they do produce a huge amount of muscle for primarily the Democratic Party. And they do vote overwhelmingly Democratic. It is also the group that has the smallest percentage of people in another party. In other words, Hispanics maybe 60-40, um, African Americans overall 80-20. For black women and other women of color, 90-10, 95-5 in some places. So on one hand, they are very critical they are a model of citizenship. On the other hand, who said it was their responsibility to carry democracy on its back? What's the matter with the rest of you guys? Um, and it has been a never-ending source of grief and consternation that white women have continued to vote their race and not their gender, by and large that they have prioritized what they think is their economic interest, believe me, it is not their economic interest, over reproductive rights, over social justice, the rest of it. 
Now, what I observed in 2018 was some change, that there were white women, and several of the women I outlined, the woman from Alabama, the woman in Midland, um, were white women who had finally gotten the game. But it is a real problem when you see a significant percentage of white women voting for a party that would deny reproductive freedom, that traffics in misogyny, which is now so apparent and so virulent, what is going on? What is the matter with these people? And the answer is, I say it again, race trumps just about everything in America. And there has to be a real effort, there has been a real effort in this election by the Harris team to reach out to suburban women of all races. And by the way, this notion that the suburbs are all white is wrong. Um, it is wrong. The suburbs in the last 20 years or so have become much more diverse, and frankly, that's how Joe Biden won Georgia, by heavily winning, putting resources into the greater Atlanta area, which not only has a high percentage of African Americans, but Asian Americans who made a difference in the election. So I think it is a matter of focusing their attention on what is in their interest, of doing the hard work, of not assuming that women, because most women are Democrats, that they will automatically vote. They obviously don't automatically vote for the Democrats. It is about explaining their self-interest. It is about explaining the ramifications for electing one party or another. I will say, that the biggest influence and the biggest change in the electorate in my lifetime was Dobbs. That was the Supreme Court decision that rolled back 50 years of reproductive rights that reversed Roe v. Wade. And since then, we have seen a disproportionate share of women registering of women of color registering. Every time a proposition, a ballot initiative was available, it has prevailed overwhelmingly with not only Democrats, but with white Republican women. Because suddenly they realize, oh my gosh, this affects me. Welcome to politics. Welcome to America. And I think that's what you have to do. You have to focus attention on why this means something for you. You would like a world in which people think of others when they're voting. Gosh, how is this gonna affect the least among us, the most disadvantaged, the most at risk? I would love if Americans were so magnanimous. They're not, and we don't really expect them to. It's about self-interest. and. You have to explain what is at stake for them. And in this case, they figured it out. Oh my God, reproductive rights. That's not only me, that's my kids, that's my daughters. Oh my God, we don't have OBGYNs in this state. I wonder why. Oh my gosh, the program at the hospital is shutting down. We're not gonna have OBGYNs. Oh my gosh, in rural counties in our state, we have no OBGYNs. Gosh, this is a problem. Welcome to politics. Let's open it up, if we can, to some questions, and we want to try to get to as many as we can, so please ask a question, not a speech, right? Uh, but we'll get to as many, so we'll go right here. Testing, testing. Okay. Uh, I'm from Los Angeles and have been a subscriber to the Los Angeles Times since 1970. It is outrageous, not only that it has turned into like a 12-page thing with an emphasis on entertainment, but they have declined for the first time in decades to register, uh, to um, uh, endorse a candidate. What do you recommend doing as a 56-year-old, you know, 56-year subscriber to do with respect to influencing a ma major uh, 
uh, media like that? Yeah, it, it is the fall of a great paper. It really is. Um, and I grew up in the 60s and 70s, primarily in Los Angeles. And it was the best paper, certainly on the West Coast. It competed with the New York Times and the Washington Post. It won Pulitzer Prizes. It had the best classical music critic. It had the best sports critic. It had the best of the best. And what happened? First of all, they sold out to a big chain, the McCormicks, and sale after sale, because they were not making enough profit, went along until the current owner, a Korean billionaire, bought it. That's what happens when you put your faith in the profit motive for papers. If you can't make a buck, well, you have to cut costs, you have to lay off writers, you have to lay off editors, and you have to tiptoe around so you don't offend anyone. And if your boss is in business, it doesn't affect his outside business interests. One of the fundamental principles of journalism is that you do not curry favor you do not serve individual interests, you serve the public interest. The Los Angeles Times is no longer doing that. And frankly, it would be better if they went out of business and Howard University started up their own Los Angeles paper. It would be a lot better off. So she asked, do, does she cancel the subscription? <laughs> Well, this is always the dilemma. Do you cancel subscription and then it gets worse and worse? Or do you hang with it? Um, and I think you can justify either position. But if you're going to maintain the subscription, by gosh, write letters to the editor. Leave messages for those editors. In most papers, you can find fairly easily, and I know it because I'm on the receiving end, um, the email for most columnists and editors, contact them, make your voice heard. And there is even a place for peaceful protest. Get a bunch of your friends together, go down to the LA Times corporate office and pick it. That'll be news, I wonder if they will follow it. to know about the criticisms or the critiques that you receive, who writes to you? I mean, is it people who disagree with you or is it people who agree with you? I'm just curious to know what kind of letters do you receive? Well, I get the death threat categories and we have a person, just to tell you this, at the Washington Post whose sole job it is to investigate threats to reporters. That's how bad it is. And we're not even talking about social media, just letters, packages that arrive, all sorts of things. And if you are a woman, it is misogynistic, it is gross, it is often violent. So that's a category. Thank goodness it's not the majority. There are a group of them that are at a girls, and that's always nice to hear that people agree with you, that people, you know, agree. There are those categories of people, and these people I love the, the most is, did you know X, Y, and Z? Readers are a great source of information, and sometimes they will put me on to facts that I didn't know about it. Sorry, I'm not all knowing. I didn't know about that group. I didn't know about that organization. My very favorite are the people who suggest books to me. I have a newsletter and I often recommend books to readers and they have started recommending books to me and that is the best. There are also those people who say, I usually agree with you, but on this, bum, bum, bum. And I think that's the most interesting and the most useful because they're not coming to you from a point of view of anger or malice. They are trying to at least persuade you 
or at least register their own views. And I think that's the most helpful, quite frankly, is people who make an argument, first of all, people make emails way too long. Um, my first recommendation for anyone writing to anybody is make it short. Um, because if it's paragraphs and paragraphs, too long to read, you know, on to the next one. So make it short, get to the point, and make a specific criticism, not, oh, I hated this, or how could you write such a thing? You know, you have anything specific in mind? Was there a fact that was wrong? Was there a different point of view that you think should have been illustrated? Make it specific, make it polite, and make it short. Um, and that's a good formula for getting a response, or at least having the person read it and think about it. I wish I could respond to all of the emails and the social media that I get. Well, not all of it, but the ones that are non-threatening. But it, the volume is just enormous. So occasionally I do get a chance to. And for anyone who has sent me emails or letters and the rest, and I haven't responded, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, right here, and then we'll go here. Uh, I've read you so many times, and you are one of the most productive uh, reporters. I, I, that's how I think of you, first of all, is so productive, so thank you. Um, it's a mystery to me why our country cannot produce a paper in the Capitol that is must read for so many people. And uh, I can only say then one of the comments, they said the commentators are writing a better editorial than the Post came up with. They just recently, on Sunday, when I thought they'd have their endorsement, criticized Harris, I'll call her Harris, because she had not come out with positions on what we're going to do for 2026, for the, you know, the anniversary of the country. Uh, what a minor point. And they have not yet come out with an endorsement. I actually tried to locate the name of a journalism professor who could advise them because I think they've so lost their way. And they have no women on their editorial board. They got rid of the two women who were on there. I mean, they're so with the paper. But um, it, it's a really sad thing for, given the importance of our country. Well, how to put this delicately? Um, the Washington Post has had ups and downs. Um, it has a illustrious hi history from the 70s of Watergate and Vietnam. It doesn't do everything well. And there are areas that I would hope they would invest in. Covering Washington, D.C. itself. There is a government in Washington, D.C., not the federal government, the Washington, D.C. government. Hello? There are decisions made about crime, made about education, made about housing. There is a phenomenal debate in Washington, D.C. about affordable housing. We have a mayor who has been relatively successful in getting tens of thousands of units made available as opposed to hundreds, which many have cities. People should know about this. And I understand that the audience outside Washington, D.C. is bigger, so they want to aim big. But you still have to cover what's in your own backyard. And what's in your own backyard has national implications. It is a window into the rest of the country. You think Washington, D.C. is any different in terms of their Homelessness problem? No. It's the same essential issue, whether it's big or smaller. It's the same set of issues in every major city. So if you're not covering what's in your backyard, you're missing a lot of that granularity, uh, n nuance. And so I would hope there would be an investment there. There are two kinds of columns in the opinion section. One are editorials that are written as the questioner said, by the board. There are a number of people, you can read their names, 
I think diversity would be a very good idea. I think more diversity is always preferable. There are then columnists like myself who are regular contributors, and then there are outside folks who submit columns, and you too can submit a column, um, for consideration. And so you will get columns from everyone from a COVID scientist to the President of the United States to a political scientist, and those frankly are some of the most interesting because you get a expert opinion in a specific area. But there is room for improvement. Uh, I will grant you that. And I think the way you improve the Washington Post is by contacting reporters and editors. They care deeply about what informed readers think. I cannot stress that enough. If you're polite, if you're short, if you're to the point, that will make a difference. And if a lot of you get together and decide this week you're going to write to the Washington Post, you're not going to write the same thing. You're going to write each your own individual thing because the story on page XYZ was ridiculous and left out these facts. Then they really do listen. So I think the Washington Post, perhaps more than any other paper, is receptive. You can create a dialogue, and I think the readers of Washington, D.C. have to get in the game to demand their paper be what they want it to be, to demand it be better and to more diverse. And I don't want to lay it on you guys because the paper has a responsibility for itself, but if you think of it like democracy, it's a joint effort. We all have to work for it. For just one last question. Maybe this is a good follow-up. Um, I'm Jean McGuire. So I was canvassing in Philadelphia, where I'm from, uh, the la over the last month. And um, I want you to I appreciate you commenting on a problem, I think, that could be remedied by some of this local news, but really is embedded in how the Democratic Party, basically people said, we see you every four years. So there's a way in which, maybe back to your earliest thing, people don't know how government works, they're not seen in their pocketbook or in their neighborhood, maybe people do disappear ever four years, maybe folks don't understand how things work. But it opens that space for the kind of populism of a Trump to come in. So could you talk, I don't know how much you talk about party stuff, but could you talk about how democracy in action in the Democratic Party is not necessarily a sort of ongoing presence, or if, or if that's your perspective? It's a great question. How do you reach out? How do you inform people? How do you engage people? I'll give you a great example, which is the state of Wisconsin. The Democratic Party in Wisconsin is headed by a dear friend of mine, Ben Wickler and you may have seen him on the news, you may have seen him elsewhere. He is the best party chairman in the country. And why is that? Because he has fleets of volunteers who are empowered at the grass level to engage with their neighbors, to have a get out the vote campaign, not by neighborhood, but by block, by block, by block. And that's how they figure out what's important to them. That's how they figure out what matters. One of the things that the previous Supreme Court that was conservative dominated allowed was a highly, highly gerrymandered state legislature so that they would cut the lines just to get the right number of people so, oh look, Republicans have a big majority in a state that's 50-50. How did that happen? And by going door to door and engaging with voters, they found out this mattered to people. They figured it out. Why is my neighbor across the street voting for somebody else? And why do I only have these choices? Why does the Republican always win in my neighborhood? And what happened to that person? That kind of feedback and engagement with people sparked a huge movement, helped fuel a 
Supreme, state Supreme Court race that was one of the most important in the country that also featured the abortion issue. But for the first time, gerrymandering was a top issue. That's how democracy works. It has to be an interchange. It has to be a person-to-person -person exchange. The best way to reach people is not through advertising. It's talking to someone they know or engaging people in a conversation. And one of the great tragedies of this era is that people are afraid to talk to one another or afraid to talk to someone who might disagree because, oh gosh, it's gonna be another fight. But there are ways to do this. And I certainly hope, and I think it is true, that one of the skills you learn at an institution like Trinity is how to have a principled civil conversation. And you begin not with, why do you think that? You begin with a concern or a fact. Did you know that there are no OBGYNs in most of the counties in Wisconsin? No, I didn't. Why is that? Well, let me tell you. And then you begin a conversation, and then you begin a dialogue. Start with facts, start with concerns, because they may be just as concerned about women's health as you are, but they haven't seen the connection between that and a 1959 abortion ban. Give people time to come back. And I will say, I'll finish on this. There was a moment in one of the three town halls that Liz Cheney and Kamala Harris had that I thought was a stunning example of what we're talking about. The issue came up of abortion. Liz Cheney has been part of the, I call them forced, abort, forced birth crowd, but she refers to herself as pro-life. And she independently said, you know, it really concerns me that women are not getting the health care they need and that they deserve. And that has to change. Wow. A concern, a fact. Now, Kamala Harris could have said, what did you think was going to happen when we put abortion bans in place? That would have been my reaction, but that's why I'm not a politician. Um, instead, Kamala Harris seized upon that and said, I think there are a lot of Republicans that didn't envision this was going to be the end state. Now, whether she really thinks that and whether it's true is immaterial. What she is doing is opening the door for people to come through. And you have to start opening the door for people. That's how democracy works. And that is how civil, intelligent, productive conversation works. So it's a really long answer to your question, but I would commend you, you can find them on C-SPAN, to watch one or two of those. They're about 40 minutes long. You don't have to watch the whole thing. You get a flavor of it. That's how you engage back and forth. So here's to opening all the doors. Didn't you all enjoy this conversation? Let's thank Jennifer Rubin for your time and for being here with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer Rubin. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Aren't they great? Absolutely. We're going to take a 10-minute break, and we're going to be back here at 10 o'clock, or 11 o'clock, which I know is eight minutes, but come back by, 10, by 11 o'clock. Uh, Jennifer Rubin's book is out on the table outside if you haven't received a copy yet. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Jamal.